Ladies and gentlemen, we are delighted that uh, our own member, Dr. Alice Fein, has graciously offered to join us this morning to share with us his perspective on the virus and the vaccine. And uh, he'll be making a brief presentation and, and we have received uh, nearly 30 questions already. Uh, so, uh, and uh, Alan has received those questions and will be responding to those questions after his brief presentation. Dr. Alan Fine is a clinical professor of pulmonary medicine and critical care at the Zucker Northwell Medical School at Hofstra University and the NYU School of Medicine. He's a practicing pulmonologist with an office in Lake Success. He's managed over 1,000 COVID-19 cases. Uh, Dr. Fine and his wife, Laura Greenblatt, longtime members, active members of our congregation, Congregation Le Dorvador. We're delighted that everyone has uh, joined us uh, this morning. And um, uh, when it is time for the question and answer period, if your question has not been answered, we will ask you to raise your hand and uh, you'll have the opportunity. So without any further ado, uh, it is my honor and privilege to call upon Dr. Alan Fine. And as I said before, if you can, I encourage you uh, to put the, uh, your view into speaker view, and that way uh, you can see Alan uh, front and center. Alan, you are on. So fortunately, uh, much of uh, the business of medicine not the majority, but much of the business of medicine takes place on Zoom. Patient visits, meetings, teaching. So uh, I am uh, comfortable talking to all of you uh, on, on, on Zoom. I, as the rabbi said, uh, I just felt that this was a, an appropriate time for uh, questions, uh, <laughs> to be fielded regarding uh, COVID and particularly COVID vaccination because it has just become, uh, I won't say universally, but more available and hopefully soon universally available to everybody uh, who wants to get it. And there has been a lot of confusion and I would say missteps and delays with the rollout, which has added to anxiety. So my job, as I see it, is to uh, uh, discuss the situation and also hopefully to allay a lot of ang uh, anxiety. I have a number of questions, but fortunately, many of the questions are the same. So a lot of people are feeling anxious about the same thing. So I thought I would just briefly, I have a watch here, so I don't want to take, I want to leave more time for questions submitted. And afterwards, if there's anything else that comes up, we'll be happy uh, to handle it. Uh, the, um, I thought I would briefly uh, talk about uh, COVID and COVID vaccines. Um, uh, I would ask if we were in a room together, I'd ask for a, a show of hands as to whether no. viruses uh, or what are viruses, are they actually alive? Uh, that is a debatable question. Uh, they, viruses have been described as molecules at the edge of life. Some people would classify them as living others as not alive because they do not carry on the usual functions of a living organism. They are bits of uh, genetic material wrapped in proteins that they're sort of like uh, um, uh, gorilla warriors. They, uh, their job is to sneak into your cells and overthrow the government of your cells. So they are revolutionaries. Uh, they do not have the ability to reproduce themselves, but 
actually uh, their job is to get inside your cells and get you to reproduce uh, them using your internal cellular functions. And uh, there are various ways that they get into people's cells. Now, there are 3,000 identified classes of viruses, and they uh, infect. In fact, the first viruses discovered were viruses there, there, uh, to, uh, that, that invaded tobacco plants. They were, the, and that, that's what we learned when we were first studying virology, but they were virus, plant viruses were the first discovered. And even during the uh, first influenza, the great pandemic in 1918, uh, it was not clear that that was a viral problem. They knew it was in some kind of infection, but not clearly a viral uh, problem. So viruses are these molecules at the edge of life. Their job is to invade, uh, to get into your cells and get your cells to make more of them. And there are two types of viruses, you know, major types, uh, DNA, and most of us know that DNA is uh, the uh, uh, code that, uh, the genetic code, that um, uh, operates and uh, carries out and instructs all of our living functions. So that's DNA and there are many DNA viruses. There are also RNA viruses. RNA is the messenger. I, I, I think a good way that it's been described as the either the Snapchat if you're younger or the post-it note if you're older, of uh, the body. Uh, RNA is the message that the DNA sends to various, what, not organs, but organelles within the cell telling it what to do. And there are many RNA viruses of which COVID um, and uh, uh, I'm not sure how COVID uh, got the name COVID, but uh, um, Kellyanne Conway, for example, said that there were, since it was COVID-19, it was, there were 19 variants, but in fact, it was named in 2019 when it was first uh, recognized. So it refers to the year, not the number. It is a coronavirus, which, I have learned about since I was uh, in medical school, they are extremely common uh, viruses, RNA viruses that are very common causes of the common cold. You know, they're one of those many viruses that cause the common cold. Uh, there were three mutations of this virus, the common cold viruses. I don't know, there's probably 50 coronaviruses, but three mutations. One which we started in the uh, pulmonary and infectious disease community getting excited about in the early 2000s it was called SARS, S-A-R-S, Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome. It was also coming out of China and Asia, uh, it was, it is and was more deadly than uh, coronavirus, COVID-19. Uh, the real name of COVID-19, so I said it's called SARS. The real name of COVID-19 is SARS-2. So it is very, this is a relative of that virus that broke out in the early 2000s, very deadly, but uh, Unlike uh, the uh, its uh, COVID two relative that we're seeing now, it is a um, uh, it's more deadly but much less transmissible. Then there was the next version of this virus called MERS, which was the Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome. 
coming out of Saudi Arabia, the Gulf states, also more deadly, less transmittable, and they seem to have uh, disappeared uh, over time. They were contained, disappeared, not significant by maybe 2000, late, early, around 2010-ish. Now we have uh, SARS-2, also called COVID-19. And I'll just uh, interject that a lot of the progress that was made in the vaccine uh, for COVID-19 or SARS-2 came because uh, there was a lot of scientific effort put into the original uh, SARS and MERS. So they were kind of ready to produce a vaccine that probably wasn't necessary for those organisms, but for the latest version, which is highly infectious, highly transmissible, maybe less deadly, but more transmissible. So we were ready with various vaccination strategies. Uh, I'll just offer a brief word about uh, uh, COVID-19 or SARS-2. It kind of broke out of China in December of uh, 2019. That's the COVID-19. Um, it wasn't clear what was going on. It, you know, I mean, everybody knows the, the story about Wuhan. It came out of Wuhan. My wife and I, Laura, interestingly visited that market as tourists the year before. We saw all the uh, very interesting bats and animals that they were getting ready to uh, put in the stew pot. And, uh, but we went as tourists in Wuhan the year before, but uh, it seemed to be focused on a live animal market uh, in Wuhan, China. Wuhan, you know, they say about China, it has, uh, there, uh, there are, 10 of the 20 largest cities in the world that you never heard of, Wuhan being one of them. It's where most of the computers in the world are made. Uh, it's, an, it's just an enormous city, an enormous. I mean, I don't know, it has, I think, 25 million people in it. Um, but it came out of there, and there have been speculation, the, the most reasonable explanation but may not be true is that it that the SARS-2 uh, virus uh, was a bat virus and most SARS uh, most uh, coronaviruses are bat viruses they can infect, infect different kinds of cats and animals as well but primarily bats and that uh, the proximity of this virus to people uh, in the market and maybe some mutations led to its spread initially out of this market. There are other theories that uh, it came from other animals. It had nothing to do with the, the market at all. Uh, there is a theory that it was, and this has happened before where uh, uh, microbiologic warfare, germ warfare, laboratories either purposely, which I doubt, or accidentally, which has happened many times in the past, uh, certainly in Russia. There are many examples uh, where germ warfare, the, some accident occurs and it releases a modified virus. Currently, the, the bulk of the evidence favors it being a natural virus that, that jumped from animals uh, to humans. Now, I, again, I will interject that uh, this is a common problem. Uh, it is thought that m many, many illnesses that we suffer from are uh, transmitted initially from animals and they become uh, set up in um, humans. I will say HIV which I got to experience the uh, epidemic from the start, uh, is uh, thought to have uh, jumped from uh, uh, apes to humans. 
uh, the um, uh, uh, Ebola is definitely a uh, also thought to come from bats to to humans. There are many, many what we call zoonoses, animal diseases that jump to humans. Influenza, the uh, swine flu and the bird flu also jump to humans. So this is a common, it's not like this is very unusual. This is common. And uh, again, I don't know how much people have been following the story, but um, the, uh, this epidemic or something like it has been predicted for at least 20 years. Uh, there are, I, whew, I don't know, a hundred medical articles, 500 articles uh, describing this scenario. They uh, have gamed it out in Homeland Security and Health and Human Services. There have been many popular books about the coming plague, the coming uh, pandemic, where they didn't know what it was gonna be, but they knew something was gonna happen like this. So uh, despite that, like many situations, we were unprepared. Now, I will say the good news about uh, COVID having lived through the initial phases and what is available now is that uh, the ability of the medical community to deal with it is much better. We have a much better idea of what works, what doesn't work. I think your chances if you, uh, hopefully not, but were someone to catch it, their chances of living are much, much higher. We have a variety of therapies, uh, some of which are, seem to be better than others, but we do have therapies. And what to do early on is much better uh, recognized. So uh, I think, although the rates of infections are quite high, the mortality is um, lower than it had been. They say the chance, uh, a, a uh, influenza, which certainly can kill you. I've seen many, many people die of influenza, but the mortality is, let's say 0.2%. It is reported that the mortality of COVID is, is not 0.2, but 2%, so uh, tenfold. And uh, it also is a very, weird disease. I can answer questions about it. It, it has many, many symptoms that, and many re results uh, that have nothing to do with the respiratory system. Uh, some people have described it, and I, this is how I think of it, as a, a, a disease of blood vessels that can affect the lung, the brain, the heart, uh, a big issue. Uh, and probably the only disease that I am aware of that uh, um, results in this is the effect on taste and smell. This seems to be a problem with uh, the first cranial nerve comes coming through the brain and it damages uh, that nerve, which affects our ability to taste and smell. The other unique feature of COVID is um, that it has, you know, we, we see it every day, it's about half of my practice now, half of, um, and I am at ProHealth, is about post-COVID. Um, and we see people say, well, I am uh, two weeks into it, or I'm three weeks, and I still don't feel right. It's, it's a very prolonged illness. Uh, I would say minimum of four to six months. And sometime there, we don't know, there may be lasting effects. There's uh, at least 200,000 people on a Facebook group for people who can't smell anymore or smell things inappropriately. And, uh, but that's just one of many, many, many uh, uh, effects. And there's a whole issue of what's called long, haulers with COVID. So uh, aside from the many treatments that are available, including monoclonal antibodies, uh, steroids, um, remdesivir, not hydroxychloroquine, but uh, 
there, uh, there thankfully has been this uh, development of vaccines, which I say said were already in the works related to the precursors of SARS-2 for SARS-1 and MERS, which are all in the same family and quite similar genetically. And these vaccines, uh, uh, there are about 30 of them in various stages of development from countries all over the world, the United States, United Kingdom, um, parts of Europe, China has a few, Russia has a few, and they are in the in various stages of testing. They got they are not full, none of them are fully approved. What has happened because of the dire consequences on people's lives, uh, their functioning, and the economy, they have given what's called emergency use authorization to those that seem to have be most promising. Usually it took an average of seven years to get a vaccine approved. This is under a year for some of them. So the, and there are many, many technologies to uh, develop vaccines. And some of them are really mi miraculous in the way that science has been used. The two as I think most people know, that are available are the uh, one developed by Pfizer and a German company, I think it's Biotechnica, and the other is the Moderna, which is an American company. Uh, and those vaccines used for the first time, I don't think there's ever been uh, vaccines that use this technology. What, it, what these vaccines do is their uh, bits of um, RNA uh, that are attached to fat particles that are injected. And that RNA that is injected goes into muscle cells and uh, they, it instructs them to make uh, parts of what's called the spike protein. You've seen them, you know, in all the cartoons, see those funny spikes coming off the uh, structure of the um, uh, COVID uh, virus. And, it, and those spikes are what allows the COVID virus to attach to cells through, I don't know if people are, uh, there may be some people on blood pressure medication uh, called uh, um, uh, uh, blood pressure uh, medication that use uh, receptors uh, to uh, that are blocked, um, and uh, this vaccine causes these spike proteins to be produced. Remember, it's not a full virus; it's just a spike protein. The spike proteins generate an anti body response of our own body and also not only antibodies, but we've come to understand that protection against any infection is not only related to antibodies, but related to uh, lymphocytes, different types of lymphocytes. So it activates those lymphocytes, I call them T lymphocytes and B lymphocytes and induces, an, and they're what um, induce uh, memory. So uh, it's even been described as sim similar to the memory we have in our brains. They remember these organisms. And if they ever uh, are presented with these organisms, this spike protein again, they're going to make more antibodies. So uh, the idea is to get the body to make these spike proteins through these mRNA vaccines. Those are the two that are generally available. Um, uh, and those antibodies and activated T cells prevent uh, infection. There are, oh, as I said, another 28 coming down the pike. The um, uh, AstraZeneca Oxford vaccine uh, uses um, uh, DNA that is uh, introducing the cells 
through a, I believe it's a chimpanzee um, adenovirus, another virus, a DNA virus. And so it, it, it uses another virus to get into uh, the cell, not, the, not like the RNA virus, it uses another virus as a vector to get it into the cell. This virus is non-harmful to humans, pretty well established, well established, absolutely established. Now there are other, many, many other vaccines that use more traditional technology, which is, has been inactivated virus. I do not believe there are any live viruses uh, being used, although they have been used in the past in many vaccines. So uh, what is available now and thought to be most efficacious are these RNA viruses, uh, RNA vaccines that are being administered as we speak. And uh, we'll get into it. The, the, uh, having lived through a lot of these uh, epidemics, it's always easier to talk about uh, getting the vaccine manufactured, produced, and out in the public than it is to do it. And we're seeing the uh, results of uh, incomplete planning and uh, not such a great rollout. It's better than nothing, but the rollout has not been uh, I ideal. So I am going to now, if, if people have questions at the end, I'll try to deal with the questions that were um, sent to me. And actually the question uh, probably put out there by 10 people, I think we had about 20 questions, was, um, after uh, I get my second vaccine, and we'll talk about whether uh, um, uh, whether you need one or two and what that's all about, but um, uh, can I transmit the virus? In other words, many, many, uh, many, many uh, vaccines that are used uh, reduce the severity of infection. I, I don't know, there may be some people who've got pneumonia vaccine, for example. That does not, pneumonia vaccine, which they advertise on TV and we have signs up in our office and it's recommended for everybody, other people, but everybody over 65. It does not uh, reduce the uh, acquisition. You, it doesn't reduce your likelihood of getting pneumonia. It just significantly reduces the severity of pneumonia, of the pneumococcal pneumonia. The same thing, the same issue comes up here. We know that people who have gotten the two common mRNA viruses, the vi vaccines, the Moderna or the Pfizer, um, have reduced market, tremendously reduced illness. And just to answer any questions about one or two, even after one uh, vaccine, it's at least 80% effective, becomes closer to 90 to 95% effective uh, by the second, but 80% after one. And uh, it, um, uh, but it is not known, it is preliminary data suggests that it will reduce transmissibility, but it is not known for sure whether you can still transmit. So that's, that's a question mark uh, yeah, uh, about that. And it's, it's come up at least a hundred times in discussions with uh, virologists and vaccinologists uh, probably prevents transmission, but not, uh, 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 not, no, not known. The other uh, issue, which I, I said that uh, they seem to start working within about 10 to 14 days so that uh, uh, there is protection very quickly. And they peak, the first vaccine peaks uh, within 
uh, a month and then get the second peaks with another within another month. There is controversy now. I mean, under ideal circumstances, you definitely want to get the two vaccines. However, uh, as I said, 80% with one seems to be what is happening. And a lot of people are um, recommending that we give out all the vaccines and not really worry about when to give the second, maybe recommend that the second be given, but whether it's given in a month or two months or six months may not be all that important. Ideal circumstances, you get one, then three weeks or four weeks, you get another, but probably not uh, necessary. Um, so we did, we dealt with the transmission. Uh, question about whether the new variant now everybody thinks it's there's one well I don't know about everybody there are at least four new variants there have been four major mutations of the virus uh the latest one coming out of England and there's another one whew, coming out of South Africa that uh, one which may be more virulent the other the one out of England is more transmissible the, th the thinking is that the vaccine will be effective against these uh, variants. And uh, again, what we're talking about is that spike protein, unless there's a major change in that spike protein, the vaccine should be effective. Um, uh, the, uh, so, it's the best we have now. Now, a lot of people are asking, when can I go back to normal? And uh, someone else asked, will, uh, you know, if it's, let's say 80% or, uh, for example, the, um, the uh, uh, AstraZeneca vaccine maybe is 60%. Uh, when can I go back to normal? How do I know I'm not that 40% that can get infected or 5% that can get infected? I think you have to understand, I mean, important to understand what a clinical trial is. Clinical trial, they take the most ideal candidates uh, for a response and give them whatever. It could be a vaccine, it could be a drug, the general population is excluded. Uh, people who have uh, other illnesses, what we call comorbid illnesses, diabetes, heart disease, cancer, uh, rheumatologic disease, getting very, they're out of those trials. So you can't be sure, in an, if you have anything, if you're a normal person with any <laughs> general condition, uh, particularly conditions that could uh, reduce your immunity, you may not have that same 95% protection. Uh, as you approach 65 or 60 even, they have what's called immunologic senescence. It means that your ability to respond to vaccines drops. There's about 40 reasons for that. So you may not respond as the way these ideal candidates. I, I have two former students who are now attending physicians in their 30s who were part of the Moderna trial. You know, the, these people, they're, uh, you know, working out, running marathons, no meds, no comorbid illnesses. That's not the population we are worried about protecting, but those are the people who were tested. Okay, trying to fix my shirt here. Um, so, uh, whether we will go back to normal life, it's the hope. I would expect that will happen earliest next summer, latest next fall, but I think uh, it's not, uh, I don't think any of us 
uh, can say, oh, I took the vaccine, I can go back to, uh, you know, I'm protected, I have a shield. We don't know in an individual's case how much protection they're going to get. So the uh, current social distancing, mask wearing, hygiene, I think one of the bits of information or one of the uh, inf important information is that the, vi the COVID virus is not spread by contact or in only in very, very rare situations is it spread by contact. So I think we have been able to relax somewhat and that people who are microwaving their mail or you know, not opening it for a week or whatever, not necessary. Uh, when we started, we when I would come home from work, we put all our clothes, which were scrubs, in garbage bags and immediately wash them in hot water and not necessary. But the usual mask distancing requirements, which is very painful to all of us, you know, on a social level, is uh, probably going to remain in effect till we see what the effects, how the effects of the vaccine has been in the general population. So uh, okay, so we want to continue uh, social uh, distancing. People are worried about the safety of the vaccine. These vaccines are very safe. Uh, like any drug, I mean, I, I've been involved with people in the emergency room. They take one. Uh, a dose of oral penicillin, they go into shock. So any medicine, aspirin, Motrin, uh, well, any blood pressure uh, medicine, you know, uh, the, the uh, whatever it is can cause people to have allergic reactions, as can any vaccine. It is very, very rare. The people who had immediate severe reactions were people who in general already were carrying EpiPens because they'd had reactions to many, many other things before. So the vaccine is very safe. The, uh, um, there's ethylene glycol in it. And if you've had a reaction or you're concerned, the allergist can test you for reactivity to that and reassure, uh, re reassure you. But in general, highly safe. Uh, you, I think you can expect, I received the two doses and you can expect uh, say like half the time to have some kind of feeling crappy after, especially after the second dose. You know, uh, my son received, re uh, received the second dose and he, uh, he still worked a full day, 12 hours. So uh, I was glad I didn't have to work after the second dose, but I wasn't a, a terrible uh, illness. Um, it says, yeah, are there consequences? You're able to get the first and the second is unavailable. As I said, the first is getting the first provides most of the protection. And I am anticipating that the second will be available, but um, I think getting the first is most important. Uh, people want to know if New York will guarantee the second dose. Uh, I don't know what that means. I think, uh, <laughs> you know, a lot of, I won't get into which hospital systems uh, guaranteed the first dose. And when people came, they said, oh, we don't have any, we ran out. So there's no guarantees, but for the most part, people have been getting uh, the doses that are, um, uh, there is no need to get a, an antibody tighter before or after, except for curiosity. Um, if you have an antibody tighter and you did not get monoclonal antibody for treatment or did not get the vaccine, that means you had the infection uh, but it is recommended, even if you had COVID infection, that at three months later, you should start the vaccination process. The evidence 
so far is that the vaccine provides better protection than natural infection, better and more long lasting protection. So it is recommended even if you do, um, and I apologize if I tilt, I'm reading the questions. Uh, Yeah, my, a Pfizer and Moderna, some want to know if they're similar. They're almost the same idea. I think Pfizer, they are looking very urgently to the, the, this lipid particle that allows entry of that RNA into your cell is cold sensitive. So you, you gotta warm it up and then give it. In the case of Pfizer, I, Think it's like a day and in case of Moderna you have know, five days but and it and the temperature requirements for Moderna are not as significant as the super cooled freezing of Pfizer but they're looking to provide a vehicle that doesn't require freezing at all um, so uh, the two shots are similar, the Pfizer and Moderna. It is thought that they, they have shown to be better than the uh, AstraZeneca and also the Johnson & Johnson, which are more, the Johnson & Johnson is a more traditional vaccine. So the mRNA vaccines are better, but I would take whatever they give you. Uh, um, Okay, transition issues. Uh, okay, uh, I, I think uh, people want to know if you showed up at, and you weren't a New York City resident, they'll take you, if you sign up, you get, a, you know, you meet the criteria, which at this point is anyone over 65. Uh, we have been told that we will have the leeway to decide if people have, uh, uh, comorbid conditions that warrant it because, you know, uh, there's some 90 year olds who are healthier than some 55 year olds. So I don't think we can, uh, you know, just take age, but in general, age is, you know, a marker for having more illnesses. Um, uh, how long does the a vaccine offer protection well, I think probably at least a year, but it's still unclear whether they're gonna, we're gonna have to do a yearly flu type vaccine. I think we'll know, you know, as we, uh, that's why I say we, you can't really let down your guard until we see what the actual, not the proposed effects of this are. And, uh, you know, the herd immunity, hopefully we'll get enough people vaccinated. So we'll kind of disappear like uh, measles and polio. Uh, but it may be that it's going to be something more like flu where it circulates in the population and you have to be vaccinated uh, every uh, year. There, As I said, there are people concerned about getting the RNA that it's going to upset their genetic code, not. I think that is just not an issue. Uh, so uh, one, one question, do we think that Biden will be more effective at getting the vaccine produced if he uses the Defense Production Act? I think that would be helpful, you know, to get people organized. Uh, someone asked about uh, fatal responses to the vaccine in different countries. There were a couple of questions. I, I think that's very, very rare. As I said, you can have a fatal response to any medicine. And uh, it's just that, you know, uh, if you read the warning label on aspirin, you'd never take it. I mean, the, the everything has at least, uh, I don't know, at least 50 things that can happen to you taking any medicine. Uh, and someone asked about why West Virginia has been able to roll out the best. I, I looked into that and some people thought it was because West Virginia did not turn it over to CVS and Rite Aid and 
they, uh, there's a question of whether those pharmacy chains, their involvement is slowing down the process. They also uh, appear to be directing it more at the state level, not turning it over to hospital systems, which having worked in a few, I can tell you are extremely bureaucratic organizations. Uh, and I think we've covered all the questions submitted. So uh, it is, um, okay, when I, I, you know, certainly 15 or so minutes if anybody has anything else. Uh, I think it's important to know that a lot is unknown. I mean, this, this is one of the weirdest diseases I've ever come across. Uh, it's not like flu, it's not like anything that I've ever seen. So, and the treatments are also yeah, all yeah. in They're evolution right. and the vaccines are more in evolution. So I'll open it up. If anybody has questions, let her rip. I have a question. Yes, yes. Uh, uh, what is the advisability of waiting uh, for the Johnson Johnson vaccine? And uh, where was it originally said that that would be a good idea? Because I know some uh, people are waiting. Yeah. Uh, I never heard that, what? and I don't think it's advisable. I mean, you know, I, I, don't, I never heard that. And uh, um, I wouldn't wait. Whatever is available, and I know it's not very available now. It's a big mess. You know, I went in my, I don't know if Laura's on the call, but, uh, you know, there's some of, uh, some people you know, appropriate candidates were able to go in initially in the middle of the night and they grabbed, uh, you know, a, a vaccine the next day. That's very hard now. I was able to go in and Laura and I were able to get, because I've already been vaccinated, we were able to get one for her. But uh, so far it's a month, a, a little less than a month off. And uh, it's very hard. Last night I wanted to see if we could change it. Very, very difficult. Uh, most places have nothing. Dr. Fine. Yeah. What? Hi. Uh, out in Australia, they're required to wear gloves. Should we be wearing gloves? No. Uh, gloves for what? Just going out, shopping, being out. I don't think so. I mean, I don't think it's necessary. I wear gloves when I uh, deal with a active COVID patient, but I, I don't think it's necessary. I mean, high level activity would be, um, you know, use hand sanit, you know, the alcohol hand sanitizer when you get back. The chances of transmission, they're really, I, I'm not aware of any documented, uh, so they call it fomite. Fomite meaning from um, a um, surface or material documented transmission. They didn't know at the beginning, but it, it really seems to be close physical contact that I've warned people about planes. They do have good air exchange if they use it in a plane, but uh, the issue of being up close to an individual with their either breathing, coughing, sneezing on you, which has happened to me a million times on planes before COVID, uh, is a real risk. Uh, again, you know, you assess it based on other factors, what your risk is, how many illnesses you have, what your immune status is, but I, it really is close contact that seems to do it. Alan, um, Alan, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, we do not know at this time how long any immunity will last. So my question is, are you familiar with formal studies in place prospectively to determine that? At how would they be done and what are they measuring? Well, what, how long they met, they've been following people after the initial trials, uh, people with, you know, documented, you know, with symptoms are cultured and with chat, their antibodies are checked. I think, uh, it, I can say with certainty that it, it lasts four to six months. That we know. Beyond that, I don't think we know. 
in all patients? I mean, we're now talking. No, no, there's patients. no such thing as. No, no, no not all. Know. Patients there's with a, risk factors. No, they didn't test people with risk factors. We That's don't know. Meant. We don't Alan, know. Alan, Alan, should people take Tylenol before they take the vaccine? Oh. Tylenol is fine. Tylenol has no effect on immunity. Uh, my, uh, <laughs> the CDC, and I think this is based on no data, uh, recommends you not take non-steroidal anti-inflammatory. With Tylenol is not, it's an analgesic right. pain reliever. It has nothing to right. do with immunity. Uh, the, uh, um, it is recommended that you not take uh, Motrin or uh, Naproxen or you know any of the non-steroids because they do theoretically reduce your antibody response. However, um, and my children warned me not to do that. Uh, you always listen to your children. So uh, uh, they warned me not to do it, but after uh, experience, I did have a slight reaction to the first one. And I said, uh, I better take it before the second one. Be and I did, and I still had, you know, some symptoms after the second one. So, you know, I, ideally, no, but if you're somebody who tends to react to medication or vaccines, I would, I, I think it's okay. I don't, I think it's a minor effect. I have can two you, questions. Uh, can you be on Claritin? What'd you say? Uh, does Claritin? No, Claritin has not, no, nothing. nothing. It's an antihistamine. It has no, also, nothing. the, uh, the uh, new variants. Uh, yes. When you say it's more infectious, what more can we be doing but masking and distancing and all, you know? That's all you can be doing. It just means that some change in those spike proteins allows that allows the virus to more easily attach to cells, and uh, you know that's uh, that's going to happen. It may happen even more going forward. But I don't think there's much. I, all you can do is be careful. You know, uh, distancing, limit social gatherings. I mean what we've all been doing, uh, you know, avoid like- It's not gonna call on you. Yeah, the, uh, the issue of the plane, the train, ask it. driving in cars with other, I mean, well, the, I think everything, however, I will say is relative. You know, it may be uh, important for somebody to hug their grandchildren. Okay, hug your grandchildren. You know, uh, not everybody, I'm sure, including Fauci, uh, follow, it's like, uh, you know, following the kashrut. Not everybody <laughs> uh, follows it all. The, that's what I, I explained to my Jewish patients. It's like following the 613 commandments. <laughs> we do the I best have, we can. I have two questions. questions. May I ask? Hello? Yeah, Alan? yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah, thank you. I tried before. Thank you for doing this first of all. Two points. Um, in regard to the Johnson & Johnson, my theory is that taking one full dose at a time could have a greater reaction than doing it in the two doses. What are your thoughts on that? And then I have one more. Um, as I said, there's no, well, I haven't seen any evidence. I mean, we'll know, you know, the, we'll know pretty soon a lot. There are so many medications. You know, I can think of 20 off the top of my head that were introduced and pulled very quickly. So I, I think there's no indication they do what they call the phase one, phase two, uh -huh. phase three. Phase one and uh, one, they dosing and what are the side effects? Two, uh, more about uh, dosing and side effects. Three, and we look at the comparator of evidence, but it wouldn't okay. surprise me. Again, there's close to 30 vaccines in various stages of development. Right. Okay. And, Thank you. And yeah. I just would say that just, you know, everybody knows the story of shingles, I think. So they mm -hmm. had uh, shing, uh, shingles that shingrex 
I don't know, five or 10 years ago. That was, and it's still a recommended vaccine. But then they went to uh, Zostervax more recently. And there, there will be multiple generations, even of Pfizer and Moderna. I mean, they're already talking about changing the uh, vehicle for administration so that uh, we don't have the cold uh, requirements. And they, they're, they're going to be improved. And, you know, in a year from now, or what, they'll say, oh, Oh, uh, you took the um, you took the Pfizer, but that's real old school. You should have taken the Chinese vaccine, and now that's available. So okay, and the okay. other point: can you explain uh, how you can be immune and yet host a virus and pass it on? I just don't understand that. Like you're saying, well, uh, uh, immune is not a yes or no. Immune is. Uh, uh, a a, uh, a spectrum yeah. of immunity. How, how you, Most, can, uh, you know, uh, if if it reduces the what we call the viral load to a point that it does you less harm. Yeah, again, so I after my second dose, I kind of had yeah, I you know, ache. I was kind of achy and fatigued. If that's all you got. Uh, with relative immunity, I think most of us would be pretty satisfied. Whether it, as I said, it's a spectrum. It is not an all or none. And every person that's on this call and every person in the world is going to have a spectrum of immunity from uh, um, absolute, uh, you know, the virus doesn't get in there. You know, the, the, uh, antibody response it's been interest described it and it's like putting a uh, the a sheet over these spike proteins you know so that they can't you know you're, you're putting a covering so that that's what the antibody does so that the spike can't attach to the cells well maybe it uh, there's enough antibody or uh, to knock it out 90 percent but not a hundred percent so Immunity for anything is always relative, you know. Uh, so if you're if if it knocks it out ninety percent, you're not that sick, but maybe you can still uh, give it to someone else. That's going to happen. Uh, Doctor Fine, uh, the soonest I could get an appointment is three months from now, and uh, if you have a history, a medical history of uh, different issues, is there any way of getting it sooner? Because they don't uh, ask you what your medical history is. Um, I, you know, I, I wouldn't bet, you know, I wouldn't bet, uh, Steve Camper's house. I might, but, uh, <laughs> the, uh, the, um, I would say that within a month, it'll be, you know, these prolonged appointments will be moving up very quickly as they push more. There's a lot of pressure to get more doses into the system. Uh, they said, I saw this morning in the Times, they said 27 million doses have been released, but only 5 million Hello. people got it. So, yes, did uh, you have a good walk? Wonderful. <laughs> um, anyway, the, uh, I'm saying it's going to be more available. So take what you can get now, if you can get something. And then uh, a lot of the primary care offices will have it, pulmonary, yeah. uh, urgent <laughs> cares. All right. Um, all going, I'm in the middle of watching that conversation. Dr. Fine, um, I'm just wondering, I got a date to take my second vaccine 18 days after the first, not 21 days for the Pfizer. I'm just wondering um, if I should try to get, um, you know, the them to change the date. No, it doesn't matter. It, that, that's, it's, it's, you know, it's like many clinical trials, for example, they, you know, not only with vaccine, they say, take, uh, it, it's tested one tablet in the morning and one in the evening. So the FDA approves one tablet in the morning and one in the evening, but then we find out it's okay to take it every other day or, to it once, and I, I, it's not going to matter at all. That I can tell you 100%. Take what's, what you got, don't mess. What's Dr. the fine? effect of a blood thinner like Plavix? Mindy, go ahead. Vaccine. It's okay. I'm sorry? 
What's the effect of a blood thinner like Plavix on the Pfizer vaccine? Zero. Why was it asked in a questionnaire when I took the, the uh, dose? They may be, uh, uh, it's just a, a marker for, you know, why, I'm not gonna ask you why, but why would you be taking Plavix? You know, those questionnaires are not uh, necessarily the best thought out. I, I have heard nothing about uh, Plavix. There is, uh, we do use as part of the prevent, it's been very helpful Talk about treatment of COVID, we do use anticoagulants and we do look for coagulation markers because as I said at the beginning, the COVID, the Corona 2 virus does seem to be a blood vessel virus. It seems to damage whatever damages, damages through uh, blood vessel damage and creation of my clot. So we do use anticoagulation uh, as part of the treatment of active COVID. But in terms of uh, uh, issues for vaccination, zero. Minnie, go ahead. Uh, Celine, quick question. You're welcome. In terms, thank you. In terms of the NSAIDs, what's the policy before and after? I'm sorry. In 24 hours. I'm sorry. I didn't before taking NSAIDs, Motrin, Advil. Oh, not be, you know. Don't, don't take it immediately before, you know, after any time. I, I, I think that's one of these more theoretic than actual issues. I, I, I can't imagine that it's going, I, 100%, uh, as I said, I can only tell you what I did. My kids told me not to. I did take uh, the Motrin before, uh, I'm not before, immediately after the, uh, the drug to try to, make sure I didn't feel that sick. Uh, I don't think it's much of an issue. I really Thank don't. you. Elaine, <laughs> thank you, Elaine. Thank you. Um, thank you, Dr. Al Al Alan. First of all, I want to thank you. Your, um, your information was right on target because I've been following it. Um, so thank you. Um, my question is, there are many people that are hesitant about taking the vaccine and, and their reasons for whatever, it's not important. So my question is, Unless all of us who are eligible to take the vaccine to create herd immunity, um, if that is not done, will that mean that getting back to normal is just going to be prolonged? Because what I did read, which was an impact on me, is that if we all take the vaccine, we protect those people that cannot take the vaccine and herd immunity then is established. Otherwise, do we ever get back to normal? Well, I think the more people that take the vaccine, the quicker we'll get back to normal. That's for sure. You're, you're okay. right on. Yes. Thank you. Alan, Alan uh, Irwin Tobin. Janet and I took the first shot in Brooklyn. Why, this is a personal matter, why do we have to go back to Brooklyn to take the second if we were able to get it here in Nassau County? Do you have any? If you can, uh, no, no reason. I, I wouldn't, if you can get it, get it here. Okay, thank you. Alan, hi, thank you so much for doing this. It's really very helpful and informative. Uh, Donald has reactions to these shots, so question. I, I missed, I was trying to raise my hand and couldn't figure out how to do it, so I wasn't sure if you mentioned Advil. Is Advil okay after? Okay, I, okay, it's okay. I don't think it's gonna, okay. I thank don't you. think it's a big deal. Very no, good. thank you, uh, Alan. If you don't think that the vaccine is going to prevent people from spreading it, then how are you going to get herd immunity? Um. Well, I didn't say I wouldn't. I said it will reduce the spread. We don't, you know. We'll know. I think that we'll have this conversation in a year, and we'll know if it did. Uh, uh, reduce uh, transmissibility. I mean, the leading virologists in the world don't know yet if it, you can still transmit after getting the vaccine. In other words, even if you have live virus in you, it may be at such a low level that your ability to infect another person is is reduced. Uh, but it's it, it these are unknowns now. I, I you know what. Uh, 
as I said, I've, I've heard discussion within the last week from people at the NIH, UCSF, uh, World Health Organization, nobody knows for sure. You know, if the hope is it will reduce transmissibility. It's possible it will reduce it to a variable extent. Just as I said, immunity will be conferred to a variable extent. Um, Alan? How yeah. How do you how do we stop this from happening again? Because we don't <laughs> want this to happen ever again. So what what policy can government put in effect to stop? Well, this? they are uh, without you know um, you know there's all kinds of issues, but certainly they had people. I mean, there's a lot of I, I'm not sure why. I think you know I was in China two years ago, and. It is, you know, you, you got to think of that country. I'm, I shouldn't blame you. You know, it's the same size of, as continental United States with four times the population. It is very crowded. They also have dietary practices that put wild animals in uh, connection with people. One of the issues they has been brought up is with... Um, humans impinging on wildlife all over the world, we are going to be more in contact with uh, diseases that we thought only affected wild animals. So that it's going to be a, an issue uh, going forward. But we they did realize that China was likely to be the source of the next pandemic. Uh, they had a part of the National Security Council that was dedicated to pandemics. That was uh, abolished for whatever reason. And they had uh, CDC, a large team of the CDC in China and there are in other places in Africa uh, monitoring potential infections and they were pulled down. So I think we have to recognize uh, these infectious risks to our security as much as terrorism, you know, what with traditional terrorism, either international or domestic, but infection uh, is definitely a major security risk and has to be funded and mo uh, so that monitoring uh, can be done. I mean, when I, there's a lot of chatter in China. What, we don't know whether, as is thought, it came from this market or from animal contact uh, that was unusual, uh, or whether um, uh, it came out of a lab or a modified lab. I mean, not known. But what is known is that for the first month, Specific. Uh, and th this is, you know, this is not big news. Uh, the the uh, CDC director said he was talking to the equivalent in China, and it was claimed by the Chinese that this was not a human to human transmission for the first month, which was not true. So I think having uh, back uh, germ security experts embedded where we can get it done in the places identified as most likely to be the source of infection will be uh, a very important part of uh, prevention. And as I said, this has been predicted for 20 years and it's not, you know, it shouldn't have been a surprise, you know. So uh, I, I think it's going to have to come down to to monitoring, unfortunately, uh, as I said, we have technology to develop develop virus uh, vaccines in rates that you know would be unheard of. I mean, it, these are like the miracle drugs that you can get an RNA vaccine, get the body to produce antibodies to uh, a, a protein by injecting. I mean. Uh, uh, when I was, you know, when I was in high school, I remember DNA was just starting to be taught, let alone 
where we are, uh, are now. I mean, it, it's, it's truly miraculous. So I think we're gonna, on a positive note, we're doing better with COVID uh, in terms of ability to treat it. And I think pretty much by the summer and certainly by the fall, we'll be in a much, much better place, maybe even close to normal. Alan, thank you very much, uh, by the way, for being uh, an excellent source. I've read a lot of stuff on COVID, as other people have, and you're hitting um, really the most important points in the most realistic way. I think a lot of what you read is not really realistic, and what you've said is realistic, and we don't know, and we have to, you know, a lot of it we'll see as we go along. Yeah, I know, and, absolutely. And, and I understand, and, and understanding that, and people understanding that they don't have um, unrealistic uh, expectations of what's going to happen, I think is important. So I really thank you very much for that. Yeah, and anybody, you know, uh, I'm in the uh, synagogue directory and, uh, you know, the rabbi can uh, provide my cell phone. You want to call me, call me or text me and I'll try to get back on a spe any specific uh, questions. Can I just ask something like just to finish of what you said? So it is okay to get just one shot of the vaccine. Let's say you're going to your doctor, eventually doctors will have them, but all he has is enough for one dose of all his patients. It's okay to do that. Yes, so, absolutely, take post. it. And okay. I think you can be pretty certain that you'll get the second dose. And, and the, the timing I really think is, right. uh, timing is, is not, uh, you know, the, it's not a super, I mean, right. ideally, you want to get it, but it's not, uh, you, you know, everybody will get their second dose. It's right. not clear that if you took it six months later, it might even be better than taking okay. it a month later. Okay. We don't know. So second part of the question is now you have your first dose. Let's say you have both doses and um, your groupie, your little group of uh, that want to get together and so desperately that they ache all over. So now they all have it pretend it's the first two. You're saying that it doesn't really matter. We must still wear our mask. We must still keep our distance. We must still not spit at each other with a lot of talk. That's yes. what you Yes, I think by the summer we'll know. So then everybody- If that's necessary or not. not, and enough people, the vaccine, you know, again, we don't know in an individual how protective that vaccine is so so we uh, should have angst over the fact that we go online and it says not available not available not available everybody should get all upset i can't get my shot i can't get my shot because it's not really gonna matter we're still gonna have to act well it matters, matters in that ultimately we'll all be able to get together but uh you know i wish everybody could get it tomorrow or today i uh, it's not a happy situation, but you will all get it. it. You'll get it within one to two months for sure. Right. And we shouldn't worry because it's not going to matter that much. We still have to do the same. Yeah, immediately you still have to do the same thing. Okay, that's it. Don't worry, people. You're okay. all going to get it. Don't I'm worry. Be not happy. The, not the COVID. Oh, the yeah. Alan, we, Thank Alan, you so I, much. Thank you again. Quickie. Um, I just am curious, we're talking about our community and then the wider community about getting vaccinated. So, mm -hmm. that, you know, our the synagogue and then New York City and Nassau County and New York State and every state. What's going on in the world? So immunity is good in terms of this herd community. We really want the entire world to get the vaccine. What's the, uh, what can you um, It's that? not good. It's not. It's not good. Uh, it's huge numbers of cases. I mean, you know, in Africa, the Middle East, different parts of Asia, India, um, and uh, they don't have money. You don't have money, uh, you're in trouble. So that, you know, uh, for example, I, uh, in Israel, they have actually been the best country in terms of getting people vaccinated. And uh, you know, uh, that's been reported. We've also spoken to relatives in Israel. I know close to 20% of the over 60 year old population has already been vaccinated. You go, you know, they have it in community centers and 
I think getting it to various venues is important. Uh, so they, but in the Palestinian community, I think the vaccination is like close to zero because they don't have money. And, uh, you know, they were talking about, I mean, many, many countries in Africa, be it uh, uh, Sierra Leone or Ghana, I've seen report. They, you know, I, I mean, you see the health facilities there, they're almost by our standards, non-existent. They didn't have money for gloves and masks. <laughs> They don't have clean water for washing. Uh, and the vaccine, the, the, I forget the time, but the, one of the va values of the Johnson & Johnson and the AstraZeneca, I think they're like a third of the price of the uh, 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 Moderna and Pfizer. And those, um, uh, that's a big issue. And there were no, I, at the beginning, I heard the health minister in India said there were only three super cold storage facilities in uh, some states in India. So it's a, it's a big problem worldwide. I, and they're going to have to bring the price down. It's like, in a way, what's happened with HIV. Uh, the medications used to suppress HIV in Africa are not the same as what's used in Western countries because they uh, need to have much cheaper medicine. Same thing with Alan, TV medicine. In, uh, in Israel, they started to uh, inoculate uh, the 50 year olds. My son got his Okay, today. God bless. We should do and, it here too. Um, Yeah, so that I found out. And uh, the Palestinians are waiting for Russia to send them what they asked right, for. Right, right, exactly. The Russian, the, what they call they the didn't want the They didn't want the Israelis to give them any vaccines. Well, I don't know. I've heard different stories. But anyway, they're waiting for the uh, Ru Russian and Chinese vaccine. And the Russian vaccine, I don't know if they've done what we would consider adequate clinical trials. And uh, the Chinese, what has vaccine has been reported to talking about transmission that it reduces severity but not transmission so uh there's a lot of uh, issues and believe me right. um money but there are many many palestinians have wound up got getting the vaccine in israel itself I, uh, good. That's good. yeah well they're so close and intertwined the more palestinians right they so, get they get, it, the so they get so they get it along with to, everybody uh, else yeah absolutely they've get, been getting it along with everybody else it's like, I, I'll just, uh, I'll finish here. Uh, I saw all these news reports uh, on Florida. So Florida opened, was the first to open it up to all 65 and mm -hmm. over. They said, I saw the reports, 10% of the people getting it were not Floridians and 5% were not from the United States. They right. people from oh. France and Canada. Italy people and wherever. From Canada this, are going to are going to Florida to get it. That's what my right. Canada people. has been. I, I have close friends in Toronto who I spoke to this week, and the guy, the guy is a pulmonologist. He just got his first dose, and they have there the government is being hammered in Canada because uh, they have had a very slow rollout, as had has the Europe, European Union, like um, Germany, France, Italy, also very slow rollout. So- Tell me uh, something, tell me something. Yeah. Is it true that they just don't have the vaccine to give? Uh, two parts, <laughs> they don't have the vaccine and uh, they don't have the uh, infrastructure organized to, to do it. I mean, I think in the New York Times uh, today, they have an op-ed, and I fully agree with it, about the idea that they put these different categories, you know, that confuse people. You have to be a one this or one that. It's just too complicated. It's too bureaucratic. Uh, I, I think they've made it more difficult than it has to be. Get the vaccine out to people that can deliver it, get as much, and rely on the I hate to say it, the medical experts to get the people who need it most the vaccine as soon as possible instead of 
you know, centralizing it. You know, all the vaccine goes through Michael Dowling at uh, Northwell. Mm. Uh, so it's, uh, it's yeah, got to be. David, my son-in-law, David, uh, put in to be a distributor, you know, a while ago. And, and he can only use the Moderna because they, he doesn't have the refrigeration right. or the other. And they keep putting him off. And he's a cardiologist, so he has the patients that need it as well. I don't, so they have no idea why they're not giving it to the... Yeah, well, ProHealth, where I work, has 700,000 patients in the tri-state area. There are 1,100 doctors, 700,000 patients. We got a shipment that only was the 1,200 doses, which was used for the staff. Mm -hmm. uh, we have not gotten anything. They told me, they asked me if, if I would volunteer, which I would be happy to, to give vaccine this weekend, but it, it never showed. So mm -hmm. um, yeah. I had, we're still waiting. We'll wait. Yeah. That's, um, Alan, I would like to thank you for your kindness and unselfishness right. to endlessly answer our questions, which obviously we all have. Uh, I would like to know, I've heard a lot of healthcare professionals compare the, uh, the vaccine to the flu vaccine in the sense that, and I want to know if this is accurate or not, in, in one of the major reasons to get it as soon as we can is to reduce the severity, uh, you know, as we build immunity to if we do get the virus, not a yes, cure, but yeah. that's, that's what he's Absolutely. Okay. And, and the other thing I want to know is, in a, you know, we can't all call you all day long, as I'm sure a lot of us would want to after this. What do you feel is the best resource online for us to go to at this point with ever-evolving mm -hmm. updated news? Mm -hmm. uh, in the your, in your State, opinion. New York State, you know, Cuomo has been pretty good about putting this stuff up in New York State. COVID, I, I forget what the COVID uh, information, the New York State website is pretty good. Okay, thank you so much. Okay. Everybody thanks, thanks, Alan. Thank, thank you, Alan, thank you, Alan, very, very much. much. Thank you, Alan. Thank you, Alan. Thank you, Alan. Thank you, Alan. Thank you for all thanks, your patience. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.